live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering Microsoft Ignite. Brought to you by Cohesity and theCUBE's ecosystem partners. Welcome back everyone to day two of theCUBE's live coverage of Microsoft Ignite. We are coming at you from the Orange County Civic Center in Orlando, Florida. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Stu Miniman. We're joined by Patrick Moorhead. He is the founder and president and principal analyst at More Insights and Strategy. Thank you so much for coming back on theCUBE. You're, you're, you're an esteemed CUBE alum, so. Gosh, this is, this is great. <laughs> Can you introduce me on every show, please? I would be happy to, <laughs> delighted. Um, so Patrick, before the cameras were rolling, we were talking about how many, frankly, tech shows you right. go to a year. You said 40, 45. That's about right. Yeah, yeah. I'm on, uh, I'm in, uh, I, I live in Austin, but I actually live on a bunch of planes. Right. Kind of like you do, right? right? Sure, sure, yeah. yeah. So this is your 10th time at an Ignite, or an Ignite-like show. It used to right. be called Tech Ed. So what are, what are your first sort of quick takes on what this conference, uh, what, what you're seeing, what you're hearing? Yeah, so Microsoft has a three layers, like a three layer cake to their events. You have developers, uh, you have customers, and you have channel. And this is their customer event. So um, what might seem like rehash or maybe build or inspire is you have customers who haven't heard this content before. So it's really about getting them engaged and, and things like that. And, and what we've heard, first and foremost, is we had 45 Azure announcements, but I think the biggest news uh, was about the open data initiative that, uh, I mean, how often do you have uh, the three CEOs up on stage of where most corporate data sits with Microsoft, uh, uh, SAP, and Adobe? So it, it was impressive. And that's probably the number one thing uh, so far. Okay, yeah. so let's dissect that a little yeah. bit. What are your thoughts? I mean, we're, we're sort yeah. of questioning, it's, it's a big idea. Right. When, when will customers yeah. actually see the benefit? And is, it, and is there a benefit yeah. to customers? So uh, when I look at these big corporate announcements, I'm thinking, okay, is this thing paper? Is this thing real? Uh, how far does it go? I, I think this is real. Uh, when I dug under the covers in, in some uh, ND, NDA things that I can't give details on. There's meat there for, for sure, but where this all starts is, is two things are going on here. First of all, uh, to do machine learning correctly, you have to have a lot of data, right? Yesterday's big data is, is today's machine learning. You have to have it all together. Now, you can pull in disparate data sources into your enterprise and work on that data, but it takes a lot of cleansing and you know, most of the time in machine learning is take, take getting the data ready to be worked on. Uh, what having uh, data interoperability standards means is you can bring it in, you don't have to cleanse it as much, and you can do real time analytics and machine learning on it. So it's agreement that says, uh, we're all going to come in, if it's customer data, it's going to look like this with different fields. You know, you would think something like XML could do this, but this is, this is bigger. And from a competitive standpoint, I have to ask the big question, where's Salesforce and where's Oracle, right? They're the two odd companies out. Yeah, really interesting. Um, you mentioned that there were a lot of Azure uh, announcements here, yeah. something like 45. I was reading Corey Sanders had a blog of just you know lists and lists and lists, and it's typical what we see to the cloud. You and I, we go to AWS reinvent, and it's yeah. like, oh, let's talk about all the compute instances, <laughs> all the cool new storage, all the things. There's you know cheering and you know everything for every micro and macro the thing that happens right. there. But are, are there any things that jumped out at you? Uh, we had Jeffrey Snover on the program yesterday. Right. We talked about uh, the the data boxes, like the edge and the various versions of those. Those seem kind of interesting when we talk about data and movement, but right. anything in kind of the Azure space that uh, kind of got your attention? Yeah, so aside from the data boxes, I was really excited about uh, auto ML. So three ways you can do ML. You can uh, do everything from scratch. Uh, you can take an off-the-shelf API, uh, and then you can do something in the middle, which says, uh, kind of like the three bears. Uh, right in the middle. Uh, Google at GCP announced something like this and so did Azure. And essentially what this is, is it auto tags uh, your data. It's smart enough to know that this is an image uh, as opposed to you having to start at the very beginning and hand code some data. And it's not automatic because the, the key, so a, a good example might be 
um, a, a, an audio machine learning algorithm where you might need it for an airplane, right, versus a car, versus the factory floor, versus a smartphone application. Those are all different environments and your algorithm's going to be different. But as an enterprise, you might not have uh, you know, the PhD on, on staff to be able to do that, but you can't live with the off-the-shelf API. Yeah. Th there's another thing that kind of struck me, a little bit of dissonance I saw there. Um, yeah. You've got a Microsoft Surface sitting in front of you. Yeah. Microsoft has gotten into hardware in a lot of places. <laughs> when they talked about their IoT piece, right. they were like, we're going to put things out on the edge. And then on the other stream, it's like, well, but they're open and it's APIs and developers and software, right. and not only Adobe and SAP, but yeah. announcement with Red Hat, you know, talking about all they're doing with yeah. Linux. How do you reconcile the, you know, yeah. I've heard people from Microsoft, we want to completely vertically integrate the stack, yeah. and that's not something that I hear from, you know, the Googles and Amazons of the world. It was, uh, you know, right. <laughs> so I thought we're kind of past that. Uh, you no know, one company can do it all, on the other hand, they're very yeah. open and give you a choice. How, how do you look at those so pieces? So this all stems with the slowdown of Moore's Law for general CPU compute. So as Moore's Law is slowing down, we need to throw different kind of accelerators at the same problem to keep innovation going up and to the right at an increasingly faster pace. So people have gone to uh, GPUs and CPUs, and almost every one of the big infrastructure players has done that, right? Whether it's, it's Google, Apple, AWS, they, they all have their own hardware. Part of it is to accelerate time to market, uh, the other is to get a lock-in. I'm still trying to figure out uh, which one uh, this is. Now, Microsoft is saying very clearly in um, Azure IoT Edge that uh, you can send your data, even if you have their hardware, to AWS and, and GCP. And I think enterprises are going to take a quick look. And, you know, I've been doing this almost 30 years. Uh, the gray hair, I have gray hairs to show for it. But you just have to pick your lock-in, right? Uh, enterprise IT always gets locked in, and the question is what you lock in on. If you go with Oracle and then build applications around it, you're locked into Oracle. If you go with a certain hardware OEM, uh, you could be locked into a certain OEM with converged infrastructure. So I think it's just picking the poison. You're going to have some people who are very comfortable uh, with um, going all Microsoft, and you'll have some people who want to piece part it together and, and look to the future. You know, they, they, we still have people who uh, were brought up on mainframes and they don't want to be there. Uh, they want to have flexibility and, and fluidity. One of the things you were talking about with, with, the, with the slowdown of Moore's Law, Microsoft, and, and frankly every other technology giant is really trying to stay ahead of the innovation curve. Right. Microsoft, 42 years old, is a middle-aged company, right. um, and, and really in the tech world, a really old company. Right. Is Microsoft effective at this? I mean, do, do you see that this is a, a creative and ingenuitive and innovative company? Microsoft is one of the only companies that has been able to turn the corner uh, from being um, aged and experienced, I guess like us, <laughs> and, <laughs> and moving into to the new zone. And everybody in everybody's work has had to do that. I mean, as an uh, you know, analyst used to, um, I remember getting Gartner and IDC reports on paper, right? Um, but now it's very different. We're up here on theCUBE, we're on Twitter, we're doing research reports, right? So everything is changing and, and Microsoft has had to change too. And five years ago, right, when Azure hadn't really taken off, uh, they had a billion dollar write down on Surface hardware, uh, bought Nokia, shut Nokia down. You were wondering, wait a second, what really is happening? But then Satya came in and to the company's credit, uh, has completely turned around. And I will state though, you know, there's a difference between perception and reality. I think a lot of the things that Balmer had in place were absolutely the right things. I think Satya gets a lot of credit for it, but these things just didn't magically appear when Satya came in. So a lot of the things they did were right and it was perceived uh, to be new leadership, and therefore, they're looking good. Yeah, I, I, I love it, because uh, we, had, we had quite a few Microsoft people on the program, and a lot of them, 10, 20 years with the company, 
And they said, right. it's still the vision we had, but they, you know, one, one, one articulated really well, he said, we're even more focused on the customer than ever, and that gets me really excited. Yeah. I uh, want, want to ask you, when, when people look at this show, because it's such a broad ecosystem, so many different pieces, you know, what will they be talking about later in the year? You know, my initial take coming out of it is, I'm a little surprised that we're talking so much about things like, you know, <laughs> you know, Windows 2019 and right. the Office 365, Microsoft 365, Dynamic 365, obviously it's Microsoft's strength, it's where they've got the most customers, but you know, are the operating still relevant uh, in, in, in the future? Uh, I, I met uh, with the program manager of Windows 29 servers last night, uh, Aaron, and she had said that they had 1,300 people, they had to turn away from the Windows 2019 server and it was 4,000 4, people, right? And I flippantly said, oh my gosh, I, I didn't think Microsoft still did that, right? It's all as a service, but I was just kidding, of course. But I think that, that shows the, how long it takes for people to move. But I think what we, we'll be talking about in a year is, uh, has Microsoft delivered on its IoT commitments in IoT Azure Central? Um, how much of their business has moved to, I'll call it on-prem, software in a box to, um, as a service, right? So Dynamics 365, Office 365. Uh, and then finally, I think we're going to see the workflow. And here's something that my head finally went ding on is Microsoft's strategy to, to surround the data and then do workflow on it to supplant Oracle SAP applications around the data. That's what I think we'll be talking about in a year. Yeah, one other specific, I wanted to see if you've got some data on because yeah. it's something we wanted to understand, Azure Stack. Right. The press, all agog on it for the last couple of years. Yeah. I really haven't talked to, I've talked to the partners that are working and you know, people like Intel, Lenovo and the like right. that are doing it, but I haven't talked to too many customers that have deployed service providers, yes, but what are you hearing, what are you seeing? It is Azure Stack a big deal or is it just one of the pieces in the multi-cloud data application strategy that Microsoft has? So, Azure Stack is a big deal and, and I think that it's getting, it was a slow, a slow boil, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, the company changed hardware uh, strategies. It was first an ODM model, and then it went to an OEM model, and a very narrow OEM model. Uh, the compute requirements to Azure Stack uh, were too big to some people, so it's a slow boil. But I look at what what has the competition done. Now, to be even a public cloud player, you have to have an on-prem capability. With Google, it's PKE on-prem. Uh, you have Greengrass and uh, Amazon DB that's on-prem sitting on top of VMware. So hybrid cloud, multi-cloud is a real thing. I just think it's getting a little bit slower start than everybody uh, had thought. Great. Well Patrick, thank you so much for your insights. These, yeah. were, these were terrific. It was great having you on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. We will have more from theCUBE's live coverage of Microsoft Ignite in just a little bit.